Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Governor Doug Ducey calls for a ban on new refugees into the state following Friday's attacks in Paris. A new report looks at academic growth of online charter school students, and we'll learn about a new opera based in 16th century Mexico. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Governor Doug Ducey today called for an immediate halt in accepting any new refugees in the state. This after Friday's attacks in Paris that killed at least 129 and wounded hundreds more. The governor also called on Congress and the president to immediately amend federal law to provide states greater oversight and authority in accepting and placing refugees. Over a dozen other states are pledging to actively resist settlement of Syrian refugees, though Arizona is the only state to demand a halt to all new refugees. Here now to talk more about what states can and cannot legally do when it comes to banning political refugees is ASU law professor Paul Bender. Good to see you. Thanks for being I here. See you too. Uh, the governor wants to halt placing any new refugees in Arizona, not just Syrian refugees, any refugees. Can he do that? He can say it, but he can't do it. States cannot keep people out of their states. Um, you have once you're in the United States, you have a right to travel around the country, and if the federal government lets you in, you have a right to go any place in the country. The states are not don't have borders that they can enforce. More importantly than that, who gets into the country is a federal matter that the federal government has to be in control of. If every state said we're not going to take any refugees, the president would not be able to work with other countries to divide up refugees and decide what to do. It has an a, a direct effect on foreign policy. So states don't have the right to stop it. They can't veto it. Uh, they can say they don't want them. They can tell the federal government they'd rather the federal government didn't place them there, but the federal government is the one who decides where they go. And indeed, it just, uh, kind of harkens back to the Arizona immigration case because yes. you can't, I would imagine the court has said that you can't have 50 different refugee policies. No, you can't. It, there's one policy, and that's the federal policy. And this was the, the, the 1980 U.S. Refugee Act. The governor mentioned this. I want to get to this in a second here. But what was that act? What does it say? It's, it's very broad, and it covers a lot of different subjects. The one that's most important here is it means to set up a system for the federal government um, placing and supporting refugees who come from other countries who need some kind of support, finding a place that they can go. The federal government has money that they can use to get these people to a place and to support them for a while. And it's all about how the federal government's supposed to do that. Uh, I, I notice that unforeseen emergencies are especially noted in this act. Unforeseen emergencies. Uh, overseas that would, yeah. that would result oh, in that would political result in, repression uh, sure. and political uh, Yeah, the, uh, the idea is we get refugees sometimes a lot, sometimes not so many, but all the time people are coming in asking for asylum. If the government gives somebody asylum, they have to go somewhere. And the government has the obligation to find a place for them where they can live and where they fit into the community. And the, this bill is about the, the federal administrative process for doing that. It does say that the director of Think of Homeland Security and the federal agency administering subsection B shall consult regularly not, and not less often than quarterly with state and local governments and private and nonprofit voluntary agencies concerning the sponsorship process. That's the thing that I think the governor is relying on. It says consult regularly. It doesn't say ask for permission when you want to. Indeed, the governor uh, in his statement said that the states have the right to receive immediate consultation uh, by the federal government per the U.S. Refugee Act and that feds, the feds must take Arizona and state concerns into account when dealing with refugees? I think they should, of course, take them into account because they have to take account whether this is a good place for those refugees, whether they'll fit into the community. But I don't think they should take account of the state's desires about immigration policy generally. So what can states legally do? Can they deny resources? What can they that's do? That's a nice question. Some of the governor's statements don't say keep them out. They say don't cooperate with their coming in. The state will not cooperate with the federal government in bringing them in. The extent to which the state can do that, I just don't know. You have to see what they do and you have to see what area it's in and whether they're preempted from doing what they want to do. But I would think that in general, 
the, the rule will work out that the states cannot prevent the federal government from placing a refugee in that state if the federal government thinks that's the best place for the refugee. And would the states be able to, uh, obviously, well, would they be able to prevent uh, state services going to those refugees? Well, and would they be able to prevent private groups from assisting placing these refugees? No, I don't think they'd be able to prevent pr private groups. Whether they could deny state services to these people, those are good questions. You're really asking good questions. I don't know the answer to that. It would depend on what the service is, and that stuff is not clear. Well, you've seen it in, in Arizona with the driver's licenses and things like that. Uh, it's a very delicate balance between what the state can do and what the state can't do. I think the most important thing is the state has no right to say, we don't want this person in the country and they don't have any right to say we don't want this person in the state because they're a refugee. And you couldn't enforce that much. I mean, what, would you have DPS at the borders, DPS at the train stations yeah. and, and, and at the airports? Yeah. In fact, what, what Governor Ducey is doing is, except for the fact that I don't think he has a right to immediate consultation, but he has a right to be consulted. Mm -hmm. And I think every governor does, and I think he puts it the right way. He just doesn't say, I'm going to keep him out. He says, we sh they should ask us about it, and they should, because the governor has a role in deciding whether it depends on how many people are coming, but if a fairly large number of people are coming, the state has concerns about where they go. So the consultation is fine. It'll be interesting to see what the federal government does, but now I think 20 at least states have said this. Yes. Some states have said they want them, but I don't think very many. So if a lot of states say that, the federal government have to decide whether we're going to listen to them or if they don't want them, we won't put them there or whether they'll say, no, that's not going to work. We have a lot of people. We're going to spread them around. It's not fair to have them all go to one place. Or it w I would imagine, if, if there were common sense at the, at the helm here, that maybe the, uh, the, the process for making sure that the folks coming through are indeed political prisoners or repressed folks or, or refugees, maybe that is heightened to a certain degree at the federal level uh, to make sure that no one does slip through the cracks. Oh, well, I think the federal government doesn't need to be asked by the states to do that. The federal government is certainly Well, that's as I said, concerned. you would hope that that would yeah. happen. Well, yeah, and, but that's very hard to do. I mean, you have all these people coming from, uh, uh, from Syria and, and Africa, going through Greece, going in, into Germany and other countries. Uh, very, very, very few of those people are terrorists, but mm -hmm. some people may be. So how do you tell? So, so in the same sense that the states can't tell uh, the president, you can't let these folks in, the states, honestly, they couldn't say that, vice versa. You must let these folks It's No, it's, they can't. We're talking preemption here. Yeah, yeah right. It, it, immigration policy is up to the federal government, and the federal government has the obligation to screen these people and make sure as far as it can that they're not dangerous people, but if it lets them in, then they have the right to be in the United States, and states can't say, no, you can't come here. It kind of is similar to the Arizona U.S. Uh, that the immigration case. Oh yeah, case, it's, isn't it, it is immigration. Yeah, it, and, and this is even more directly affecting. I mean, you see that the governments are meeting now and deciding what to do with these people. These governors, what do they want the president to do? Say, hey, I got to ask all the governors whether I'm allowed to talk to you about taking some refugees. That's not going to work. All right, Paul, good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Nice to be here. study by Stanford University Center for Research on Education Outcomes shows that students at online charter schools are not seeing academic growth in key areas of learning. Here to discuss the study is David Garcia, Associate Professor at ASU's Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College. Good to see you again. Thank Thanks you. Good to here. see you. And we should mention now this group uh, is from Stanford. Um, this is a group that is not necessarily anti-charter. As a matter of fact, they might be a little bit pro-charter school. 
what are they saying here? Well, you're right. It's a group out of Stanford, the Center for Research on Educational uh, Outcomes, um, and they have put out a number of studies on charter schools, many of them, many of them positive. Um, in this particular case, they looked at comparing online charter schools nationally. There are about 17 states that were in the study, including Arizona, and comparing those results to brick and mortar traditional public schools and brick and mortar charter schools. And what they found is, um, is pretty negative all the way around. Uh, they found that uh, students who attend online charter schools compared to um, brick and mortar students or students in, in, in buildings uh, lost in reading uh, 72 days of learning and in math it's 180 days. That's a school year. I was going to say they, they lost 180 days of learning in math over a 180 day school year, it's like they never showed up. It's effectively losing a school year, that's correct. Okay, why is this happening? Is it, is it the online, it has to be the online nature, but what's going on here? Well, what they did to, to test that is they compared the online charter schools to traditional public schools, like I mentioned, as well as charter schools, to try to find out is it because of charter schools or is it really the online nature? What do they find? And they come to the conclusion that it's being online. So that being online is such a unique place um, that um, they be, in particular, by the way, I should mention, students who, uh, Hispanics, minorities, students who are English language learners, special education students actually lost more time. So even more difficult for students who are harder to educate when you move on to an online environment. So an online success story regarding online charter schools, the exception rather than the rule? They, they say it's the exception. Um, there is not one state they found that had negative um, gains or growth in mathematics and only three in reading. And so in every case, they also looked at different policies. They looked at um, policies that they thought could have a relationship to more positive outcomes. What they found is some, if somebody's monitoring, there's a slight positive gain. If it's self-paced, there's a slight positive gain. Um, interestingly, if parents are expected to be part of instruction, there's a negative gain. Um, really? And everything else was not meaningful in terms of, of trying to explain these results. Is, is the flexibility of scheduling that you get with online instruction, I would imagine some would see that as a blessing. Is it also a curse? That, that's the challenge. Uh, the challenge here is it requires, I think the thought is policymakers, especially as, as we started to move more toward um, using online medium in education, that this is going to revolutionize education. The challenge, however, is you still need to give a lot of support to students who are learning through an online environment. And homes in which parents are not prepared for that kind of support did not do well uh, in this study. Uh, in addition, um, you've got to keep in mind that the thought, at least, has been historically that the goal was to, to, to give instruction. In other words, it was one dimensional. Mm -hmm. um, real education is interactive and it is a combination of both learning and talking and discussion that I think is most effective. I, I th the report seemed to suggest that current oversight practices for online charters, not enough and more accountability needs to be required before this can expand because it's, it's expanding quite a bit. They said both. They said that uh, expansion should be halted until still states get a handle on how the charter, the uh, online schools in their in their state are doing, um, and that uh, oversight needs to be looked at really universally. Like I mentioned, very few positives in the report. Because when you think about it, there's really no natural restraint on expanding online schools. I mean, it's not like you need to build a new building, you need to find a new parking lot. I mean, it's just basically sign some kid up and make sure they got a computer. And there is no natural constraint. You're absolutely yes. right. As a result, the thought was that it was going to grow. It was going to, in some times, I heard policymakers talking about taking over bricks and mortar schools. There's tremendous potential. Um, hybrid classes, I think, are, are a very positive way to go, where you harness the capabilities of the internet, you harness the capabilities of learning online, yet you still have faith face-to-face -face interaction. It's a model that I think is a nice sweet spot for, uh, for instruction. How prevalent are online K-12 schools, charter schools in Arizona? They are pretty prevalent. Um, I was looking for accounts. I couldn't get a, a, a specific count, um, but it's a sector that, that has been growing. Uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's nationally, uh, the report says it's about a percent, a little less than a percent mm -hmm. of students, but continuing to grow. And uh, I, I know it uh, from a distance, it seems like an atypical student would be, are, are being, not your typical students necessarily, don't want to get too generalized here, but they're, they're usually going to the bricks and mortar charter in public schools, whereas it's maybe an atypical student who's staying home. Is that, is that accurate? And if so, this is not good news for them. 
I think that it is more of an atypical student. That's one of the, the recommendations that came out of this, of this study, is they've got general demographic indicators for the students, things we know, special education status, et cetera. Don't know a lot about the home environment of students. Mm -hmm. Don't know a lot about the learning styles of students. And one of the good recommendations out of the study is we need to learn more about the student, about the student as a learner, to make sure they're a good match for online learning um, before they're allowed to enroll and, and take online courses. Well, Last point, it sounds like families and students, they, you've got to be more disciplined when it comes to online education. I think you need to be more disciplined. I think, as I mentioned, it requires more support. Uh, if you have a student who is struggling in the classroom, if you think about it, just getting them on a computer isn't necessarily going to solve some of those same issues. That support is going to be necessary for that student to be successful. Considering the, the, the study, who did the study, the outcomes, this is, gonna, is it a big story in education? I, I do, I do. I think it is. I think it's one where where um, we need to, to check what we're doing with regard to online education. Uh, I think that oversight, as I mentioned, is going to be important. And that match, making sure that parents, because I haven't seen much that has been out for parents to have them understand what does it take for your student to do well online, I see coming out of this as well. Good stuff, David. Good to have you here. Thanks Thank you. for joining us. Appreciate it. In northwest Arizona, just off State Route 95, stands a peculiar monument to the town of Oatman. Oddly, the marker is 15 miles from the town it honors. Wedged into the Black Mountains, the mining town of Oatman was established at the turn of the century. By the 1930s, nearly 2 million ounces of gold had been extracted from the surrounding mines. The price of gold and World War II forced the closure of the mines in the 40s. The town was delivered another blow when in 1952, a stretch of Interstate 40 opened, siphoning off Oatman's lifeblood, Route 66 traffic. It quickly became a ghost town. Route 66 is again its lifeblood. Nostalgia for the Mother Road and the Old West draw tourists from all over the world. They walk the boardwalks, hang with the local gunfighters, and are followed around by Oatman's most famous residents, the Burroughs, descendants of those set free by miners years ago. Being closer to Nevada than the town itself, Oatman's misplaced monument is long forgotten, but the town is remembered daily. Tonight's edition of Arizona Artbeat looks at Guadalupe, the opera, which puts music to the story of a culture clash and the quest for peace in 16th century Mexico. Joining us now, the opera's composer, James DeMars, and mezzo-soprano, Isola Jones. Good to have you both here. Thanks Hi. for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, why did you decide to tell this story? I had a very interesting experience. A fellow came to me and said, I want you to write some music to bring attention to the problems we're having with integration and immigration in Arizona. And we couldn't quite decide on the piece. And he said, he took me down to the park and he said, I have a story to tell you. And he told me the story of Guadalupe. He said, this is very important to me. And I realized then what a perfect parallel it was because the essence of the story is when you finally come to believe that another person can be trusted, then you can build peace on that. And, that, and that, so it's a coming together. That's ultimately what it is. I, I believe that we share a common goodness. Isola, how did you first hear about this opera and uh, what were your first impressions? Well, I've known Jim since 1999 and um, we've done some projects together. And when he started writing the opera, we just talked and he would write a line and I would say, that's beautiful, can we put it up an octave? <laughs> and um, so the very first manifestation of the opera was in concert form. And uh, we sang it, we had the uh, world premiere in Mesa and we recorded yeah. it. And now it is, it has transformed into a theatrical uh, adventure, yes. an event. And it's, it is fantastic. We've got, it's a feast for the eyes as well as for the ears. The music is sublime, it's gorgeous, it is 
it's touching, it's fantastic, you want to get up and dance. It's, it's wonderful, it has everything. What were the musical challenges here? Because indigenous uh, music seems to be a major part of this opera. Well, and it's a major part of what's been my career in Phoenix. Um, we owe a great debt of gratitude to Phoenix's own uh, Native American record company, that's Canyon Records. Uh, Robert Doyle is the man who said, if you write that, I'll produce it. And, uh, and he did. And in writing it, it meant that I had access to all of his artists. So in these performances coming up, uh, our Carlos Nakai mm -hmm. is in the pit. He said, I'll just wear a t-shirt. And I said, no, you're going to at least take a bow. <laughs> but he's in the pit. And uh, Javier Sheotl, uh, Sheotl is uh, there as well with his wonderful sounds building the, the orchestra. How challenging was the music for you? Um, hmm. Well, the first time around, it wasn't that challenging um, because we'd worked on it and I'd heard it and, and we worked together. Uh, because it's changed uh, this time and then several years have passed, it is challenging and now that we are doing it from memory. Yes. Hello. <laughs> yeah. And we have a marvelous set. I don't want to give anything away, but it's, it is challenging to maneuver the set and to keep your eye on the conductor and to remember your words. And it's, but it's, it, is, it is so wonderful. It, the music does something for the singers. We have a wonderful tenor, uh, Andrew Peck, Andrew Peck yes. who um, is singing this role. It is a monumental role for him. It's a monumental role for any tenor. And he is doing it fabulously. And it is, there's just a lot of things to do and things to see. And uh, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the challenge of it. Well, it, it sounds like you are. Uh, <laughs> but when you compose this now, you're, you're kind of dealing with religious icons, religious beliefs, traditions. Did you have to tread carefully? Well, I did. But remember, this was an invitation. Uh, Father Richard Romero, who's a, a, a dear friend, and he's out doing his thing. He is a, a wonderful man. He's the one that initiated this, and uh, Father Jorge Rodriguez uh, also supported it. Uh, James Corrubius, the artist, said, you know, this is the first peace treaty. And these fellows were, were very enthusiastic about building this and bringing it through the first production, which was an oratorio. So uh, it was an education for me. This was outside of my, my background, but I've realized we've actually brought the story to, to many people Yes. as a result. Were you aware of the fact that, again, religious icons, religious tradition, this, mm -hmm. is, this is a story that has been told for centuries, right. but people are pretty sensitive about it too. Were you aware of that? Are you yes. aware of that? Uh -huh. I was raised Roman Catholic, so um, I know a lot of the Catholic uh, traditions and um, the icon of Guadalupe is everywhere, especially here in the Southwest. She is the patron saint of Mexico, and in, in the Americas, uh, in the Americas uh, there's a church, uh, bro a part of Brophy Academy on 7th Street in the balcony. If you're standing on the altar looking at the congregation, you look up, there is a huge Guadalupe at the back of uh, that church. And it is, she's everywhere, and her message is one of love, peace, and conciliation yes. and life. And that is what she brings to uh, this story. And this is what she brings to the culture. Is there a showstopper here? Is there, is there, is there something that just, uh, just brings the house down? I, I, there certainly is a climactic <laughs> point, yes. absolutely. For those of the, you that would know the story, it is inevitably the revelation of the portrait itself when uh, the giving of roses as an indication of, of faith is not enough. And with that, he opens his tilma, her serapi, and we see this image that is miraculously embedded there. Was it a challenge to write to that climactic? I mean, people, again, they know the story. They're somewhat familiar in some ways. Mm -hmm. You have to write something new, fresh, and it'll just, just again, bring the house down. I'm using, I'm using those terms, but you know what I mean? I mean, build this thing and, and let it go. I never felt like I was writing to accomplish that. I read the story in its many, many different versions, 
and all of the discussion of the story is huge. I spent you know a year reading. Um, after that, we settled. I settled on the story. I, I say we, my collaborators, settled on the story, and then it was a matter of rendering what needed to be said. All right. Well, we have to stop it right there. Thank you both for being here. Good luck and congratulations on the production. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Tuesday on Arizona Horizon, we look at the ethics of attorneys who wrote books about cases that they've worked on, and we'll check out rare video from 1961 when the nation's most powerful leaders came to Phoenix. That's it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Arizona Artbeat is made possible in part by the Flynn Foundation, supporting the advancement of arts and culture in Arizona.